And good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Lights, Camera, Exploitation. This is your host with the motherfucking most, TJ Bowser. And joining me is my doppelganger, Kanga Banger from Down Under, Mr. Brody Kane. Howdy, you sons of bitches. And Slick Nick, the man with the big woo, Reese. Evening. So today is February 26, 2021, and we got a doozy for you today. But first, a little bit of slice of life. Brody, how was your week other than five minutes ago? <laughs> oh, <laughs> dude, don't even get me started. I am that pissed off right now. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's been it's been a yeah, bit of a um, sh- shitty week. Uh, it's been pretty – man, I'm, I'm so angry right now. <laughs> um, Talk about the phone call. That, Funk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. oh, so this, yeah, no, it's been a very interesting week at work. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, so anyway, basically, it's been quiet at work, just been watching bulk movies as you per usual. Um, uh, in saying that, I got hit on by an old lady at work today, uh, not today, the other day. So that was pretty interesting in itself. Um, bit quiet this week. Um, yeah. And as I said, watching, uh, a lot of, a lot of movies that are recommended by TJ and, um, mm-hmm. Not only that, we had to watch this beautiful yes. bad boy mm. basket case. So I'm really, really keen to dive in on this one today. What about yourself uh, there, Nick? How you been, mate? Oh, not too bad. It's definitely better than last week's. My car hasn't had to go into the shop yet. Winning. Uh, yeah, it's mostly just been quiet. I've just been working from home for the for the most part. Uh, our office full time, like move in, got pushed back uh, another couple of weeks. So I'm just going to be working from here. So it's mostly just been quiet. I've just been watching this and uh, uh, binging Futurama again for no reason. Good stuff. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> fuck, don't smoke. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I uh, watched this movie for the first time today. Uh, I know that I've seen the second film, but I've never seen the OG. But this week's just been like same as Brody, just watching film and kind of planning some podcasts, some more behind the scenes. And uh, I want to say thank you to uh, everybody that subscribed to this podcast from the first episode, all 2.2 thousand of you. Uh, we are overwhelmed and gracious by the reaction to uh, Crash. Thank you to everyone listening, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy the next episode. Sure. Speaking speaking of which, let's get on with the next episode, which is uh, 1982's Basket Case, directed by Frank Henenlotter, who also did Slash of the Knife from 1972, which is his original short, uh, Brain Damage from 1988, Frank and Hooker from 1990, and That's Exploitation, which is a documentary from 2013. Mm-hmm. Writers Frank Handenlader, cinematographer Bruce Torbett also did Brain Damage from 88. Uh, he acted as Polly from Street Trash in 87, and he did props for Frank and Hooker in 1990. Music awesome. by Gus Russo, who also did the music for Brain Damage. And then the budget for this film was only 35000 and visually you can see it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it is a filthy film. You know what kind of reminds me of? Maybe Maniac and like yeah. it, and how dirty it is. The original 80s Maniac. Yeah. That's the only one worth talking about, honestly. Uh, <laughs> like the, uh, the Elijah Wood one? I do. I mean, did good. It, it is good, uh, but I'm not a big fan of the like the point of view movies. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, that's fair. This film starring Kevin Van Hettenreich, right? Hettenreich. Rick? Hettenreich mm-hmm. as Dwayne Bradley, who also was in Brain Damage 1988, Basket Case 2 in 1990, and Basket Case 3 in 1991. He also did play a small part in that Slash of the Knife uh, short film as well. Okay. Uh, he was mostly background characters though. Fair. Terry Susan Smith as Sharon, who also did Sundays from 2011. Beverly Bonner as Casey, who did Brain Damage, Frankenhooker, and then and Hen and Lauder's Bad Biology from 2008. Robert Vogel as hotel manager who did Rent Control 1981, Waitress 1981, and L.A. Law in 87. That's a TV series, I believe. Diana Brown as Dr. Judith Cutter also was in Slash of the Knife in 1972. Lloyd Pace as Dr. Harold Needleman. This is his only role. Bill Freeman as Dr. Julius Lifflander, this is also his only role. Joe Clark as Brian Mickey O'Donovan. He did fill, uh, TV roles in The Law from 1975, Chips in 1982, and Starman 1986, and it's not the movie. So, Brody? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Most notable uh, of the cast to come out, and uh, Nick will talk a little bit, some el- other uh, notable cast here, but uh, John Caglione Jr., who started off in Friday the 13th Part 2, with some additional makeup crew, went on to do 1990s Dick Tracy, and then Heath Ledger's makeup on The Dark Knight, followed up 
by the Irishman in 2019. He uh, did make up for Mr. Russell Crowe, Al Pacino, and the late Heath Ledger. That is quite the repertoire. <laughs> Man, a little bit. Uh, I believe I also saw it. He actually was the original designer for uh, Heath Ledger's Joker's look. Oh, uh, well. so he didn't just do the makeup. He designed the character as okay. part of why he got the Oscar nom for that one. Fuck it. Eh? So, Nick, do you want to take away the plot? Sure thing. Uh, so Siamese twins, Dwayne Bradley and his malformed brother, Belial, seek revenge on the three doctors that separated them as children, tracing them all to their practices in New York City. Dwayne carries his disturbed, deformed and telekinetic half around in a wicker basket wherever he goes. Meanwhile, the troubled young man attempts to lead a normal life on the side, but his psychotic sibling becomes increasingly jealous. Okay, so uh, awards here. It played at the Cannes Film Festival. We don't know the year, but we do know it played, thanks to Joe Bob Briggs. And then in 1982, at the Drive-In Academy Awards, it won Best Flick, Best Actor, Best Monster, Best Gross Out Scene, and Best Director. Fuck it, fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cleaned up. Clean sweep for that one, yeah. <laughs> fucking <laughs> day. <laughs> so uh, let's fucking break for uh, one of my favorite parts. And go. <laughs> Okay, let's get a little physical! <laughs> so there's like one definitive release of this film. Uh, Second Sight did a release in like 2016, but we're not going to talk about that because that's not worth it. What we're going to do is we're going to spend our time on one release. There's not like two releases at the same time in this situation. And luckily, Nick has I do. a physical copy. I do, in fact, have a physical copy right here. Yes, and we have all the information here. So I'm going to read this little press release, and then Nick can talk a little bit more. Uh, Basket Case has been restored by the Museum of Modern Art in cooperation with director Frank Hannenlauter. The film was scanned, graded, and restored at Cineric, New York. The original 16 millimeter AB negative was scanned in 4K. A 35 millimeter interpositive element was also scanned for certain shots. The Restoration work included full picture stabilization and the removal of dirt, debris, scratches, and other signs of wear. The mono soundtrack was restored from the original 35 millimeter magnetic tracks by Audio Mechanics, Los Angeles. All materials for this restoration were made available by Frank Hannelauder, who approved this restoration. Ooh, indeed. Uh, it's also including uh, a 2K region-free video. Uh, got the the uh audio is still in mono uh, for this. <laughs> which honestly uh honestly i like that it is i like that it they adds to it at least for it it really really does yes, it really yes. helps the atmosphere of it to still be in mono uh the special features for this uh include a brand new audio commentary with uh frank henlotter and kevin uh Henrik as well. Okay. Um, got archival audio commentary with Frank Hennenlauter, uh, producer Edgar Levins, actress Beverly Bomber, uh, Bonner, <laughs> and filmmaker Scooter McRae. Uh, the interview with Dwayne Bradley, Basket Case Three and a Half, uh, which is in 1080p, <laughs> uh, which is a little uh, goofy short uh, by Hennenlauter himself. Uh, Me and the Bradley Boys, also in 1080p. Um, that's 1624 is the Ash Best ratio for that. Yeah, right. let let me uh, let me interject here. So the reason that they're putting the 1080p's and stuff here is mm. some uh, Blu-rays that you get from Arrow, uh, the second discs that have the extras on it will just be DVDs. Okay, so they'll yes. just be in their standard. Yes, DVDs. yes, got it, got it. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, we've got to do a, another interview with Frank Hannenlauter as well. Uh, it's probably advertised as being strange. Uh, perhaps does not actually feature Hen and Lauder, at least on screen. Uh, <laughs> which uh, also contains a moment of full frontal male nudity. Uh, for those who are concerned by such things, they warned you it was going to be strange. So, <laughs> uh, we've got Seeing Double, the Basket Case Twins, which features interviews with actresses Florence and Mary Ellen Schultz, uh, who actually played um, Dr. Cutter's assistants. Dr. Uh, Cutter! They are Real life, uh, identical twins, and Frank Hennenlotter's cousins, I learned as well. Ooh. Uh, so there is an interview with the two of them called Sing Double. We've got Blood Basket and Beyond, which is a new interview <laughs> with actress Beverly Bonner. Uh, she really yeah. likes talking about it. She really, really liked playing Casey in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Latvian Connection, which features interviews with Edgar Levins, uh, Ilza Belotis, Yugis Nigels, 
uh, or Nigels and Kika Nigels as well. Um, Who are these people? Daughter. <laughs> uh, so a lot of the production uh, crew is actually of Latvian descent, which is why it's called the Latvian Connection. Uh, and it's actually a lot of family. Um, okay. It's uh, Yugis Nigels, uh, his daughter Kika. Okay. Uh, was about eight when they made the movie. She actually was the one who had to start puppeteering Belial after the uh, the latex <laughs> hands shrank too much for adult hands to fit in. So you'll see behind the scenes photos of just this eight year old kid holding the Belial up <laughs> by the arms. Fucking <laughs> um, we've got Belial goes to the drive in, which is an interview with critic Joe Bob Briggs, who helped get <laughs> uh, yeah, established yeah. as a cult movie back in the day. He got, is uh, this film's savior. Indeed. He. he Got it to where it was. Uh, Frank yeah. Annalotter was convinced not a single person was going to see this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've got Basket Case at MOMA. Uh, it's cold from the 2017 restoration premiere at the Museum of Modern Art. Beautiful. Beautiful. A Q&A with Hen and Lauder, uh, Hent and Rick, Beverly Bonner, the Schultz twins, uh, Eugene Nigels again. Um, What's in the Basket, uh, which is a really done <laughs> well. A really well done piece giving an <laughs> overview of all three of the movies. It's close. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got that, In Search of the Hotel. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say that just reminds me um, of a little um, uh, backstory there of Hen and Lotta when, when it was getting played around the premieres around uh, New York and that the lines were like endless and everyone had baskets there. And then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and- and uh, Joe Bob Briggs actually asked him what was in the basket. He goes, it just pays not to ask. Really, it just pays not to ask. <laughs> oh, that's great. Fuck it, eh? That's awesome. Uh, so we've also got uh, In Search of the Hotel Broslin, uh, an archival featurette from 2001 that looked at all the uh, locations that they filmed at. Um, okay. We've got Fuckin the eh? Frisian of Fission. Uh, basket case can join twins and freak. <laughs> um, which uh, I actually missed that when looking over the uh, thing. So it actually, now, uh, the next one's kind of even like the coolest feature on here. I'd have to say yes. Um, yes. So the anyway the the the, the, the frisian of fission uh, is a it's a visual essay uh, that was done by Travis Crawford uh, putting the mm. film into the context of other movies about ad- outcasts specifically freaks um, mm. and then a copy of Slash of the Knife itself is a special feature on this uh, which <laughs> as we were talking about earlier is a short film uh, by Henry yes. Lauder from the early 70s uh, featuring some of the same cast members some of the same production they all kind of worked on on it somewhat um, in fact Diana Brown who plays Dr. Cutter in this was also in it playing essentially the same psychotic character and she even has the same red dress in it uh uh, but that is pretty much i believe that's her only other credit um besides um oh no 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 no. that was terry uh yeah no i believe it's her only feature length film credit is basket case one um brody has of uh brody has all of uh cronenberg's early work that i do and thank you for that mr bowser (laughs) bloody arrow was it arrow release yeah yeah. yeah it's glorious Sexy. yeah they do have yeah arrow offers like this cronenberg five pack of all of his shorts together oh that's awesome yeah it's really and then, cool and then uh what you sent video drama as a separate yes. didn't you yes yeah. nice nice well, well christmas present <laughs> <laughs> that it was yeah it, yes, was, great. it was so this great. also has uh out tat Ah, what the fuck? <laughs> Slash. Yeah, that little right. stroke. Uh, outtakes from Slash of the Knife. Uh, image gallery from Slash of the Knife. So this is kind of like a double film thing, dude. Fuck, I'd take, I'd buy Slash the Knife on its own just yeah. as a preservation thing. Basket case outtakes. Belial's Dream, an animated short by Robert Morgan. Sounds like a fever dream, baby. Making Belial's Dream. What the fuck? Image galleries, behind the scenes. What is that word? Ephemera? Ephemera? <laughs> okay <laughs> advertisements hope video releases promo gallery includes trailers tv spots and a radio spot Ooh. Ooh. without looking the word up what do you think ephemera means fuck if i know <laughs> <laughs> you have it up brody no i don't <laughs> <laughs> no. i've heard the word ephemeral before but i I'm a, I'm a Google search. <laughs> Things that exist are used to enjoy only for a short time. Ah, 
Very nice. Okay, so some additional information. By basically having no budget for the film, Hen and Lauder states that instead of seeing dailies, they were able to see monthlies. During the editing process, they had not enough money to develop the film and, and could not afford reshoots, to which he quotes, we just had to sit there and suffer with what we had. Brody, you want to talk about that? <laughs> Yeah, well, that was uh, on the interview with uh, Joe Bob Briggs, and mm -hmm. um, he he was basically stating that uh, he had to fork out eight thousand dollars of his own money. That that was all. That was it. That was all he had. And then the bloke, uh, it might have been the producer, uh, one of his mates. He um, actually handed in eight thousand dollars as well. So they only really had a budget of sixteen thousand for a start, and then they had to sort of like slowly, as as uh, the film progressed, they would do or get more money income and then that's when they could go in and sit there with the film um they yeah as it says no money for reshoots so they just had to sit there and suffer with what they had um but but by looking at this film though I, it looks like it has been made in some areas of the film more than thirty five thousand dollars. like this is actually still a good looking film for that mm -hmm. that amount of money mm -hmm. um so i think frank frank and lot of like uh, Frank and Lotta. Hen and Frank Lotta. Lotta. <laughs> Frank and Lotta. <laughs> Hen and Lotta, sorry. Um, he, yeah, he was, a, like, he was able to conjure up like a really great film with what he had. So, no, nah, hats off to him. That's what I really appreciate, appreciate about this movie. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's I great. think the, uh, product, the production overall, it took him a year to shoot it uh, mm -hmm. just because of how many times they had to halt production because they ran out of money. <laughs> they would have you just ever have uh, watched Hobgoblins or Hobo Goblins? Uh, no, no, I have no. not. Uh, that is a film that Vinegar Syndrome released. Uh, I think that has like a $15,000 budget. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'll have to look that up just to double check. Uh, yeah, Hobgoblins, sorry. Yeah. And then so, so it's Hobgoblin. Yeah. And right. it's $15,000. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'd say, and this, uh, uh, Clerks also had a similar budget. It was about okay. just, just under 30K. Clerks was actually filmed for less than this. Wasn't uh, Blair Witch Project like 22? Uh, yes, I think it was. 25,000, I think. Okay. But they, um, e even in saying that, though, like they had no uh, special effects or makeup crew on set. So oh. like they had to – so basically Hen and Lotter himself – like stuffed himself inside Belial's closure or with a mirror on the other side of the room to not, not only see himself play Belial, but also direct at the same time. <laughs> so, yeah. So their skeleton crew was, yeah, it was, it was very tiny for the, uh, the amount of money they had. So like the production of this could probably could be compared to the uh, production of evil dead one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Oh, and I actually looked at it. Uh, Blair witch had 300 K and the first paranormal activity had 15. Oh uh, yeah, damn! Yeah. Blair Witch had three hundred thousand. Blair Witch had three hundred thousand dollars for. His wow, life. that's deceiving as fuck. I thought it had little. It, yeah, it. I definitely thought it had at least less than a hundred k. Interesting, or something along those lines. But yeah, no, they. It was really. Um, they really pieced this thing together with what they had. Uh, one bit that comes to mind, at least from what I can think, the uh, uh, Doctor Needleman, uh, his mm -hmm. kill. Um, actually, him stuffing his face with the uh, the pizza when Dwayne first goes in to see him when he's sitting at his desk uh the leftovers from from that because that was actually just their lunch production like just their production <laughs> lunch uh the leftovers from that actually got stuffed into the lower half of the torso and is the gore for whatever Belial cuts him in half so it's actually made up of the pizza <laughs> and just like jam and stuff that they had to make big blood with it so half that gore is actually the same pizza he's eating at the desk. <laughs> that that also um, ties into the the, um, the scene where Belial is cut from um, Dwayne, and you and you see a final bit of uh, in, innards that fall out. That's actually a hamburger. <laughs> just raw hamburger. Just that's, just, that's it. Just raw hamburger. Man, the production of this movie was great. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so. Nick, you got uh, a Synapse Films package coming that's Basket Case related. I do. I have Basket Case 2 actually coming in, and it ah. should be here tomorrow from what I saw the USPS tracking said. Fucking A. Uh, so it should be here tomorrow. They um, also have Basket Case 3, The Progeny? They did. Oh. Um, there is a full trilogy 
Uh, the third one is not as well received. Even even Frank Henenlotter himself doesn't really like the third one all that much, uh, which he just says he takes full responsibility for. He's like, I just I rushed it. It wasn't written too well. I didn't have the story together by the time I got to it. So we just went to put it out right after two. And he didn't even want to make a sequel to this in the first place. Um, but two ended up becoming maybe not as successful, but successful in its own right. It's 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 a good film on its own. Uh, it's a little wackier. It's a little bit different than this one, which was a stipulation. Uh, like I said, Frank didn't want to make a second one. So his stipulation for it was, is I want to make this one different. I don't want it to be the exact same movie as the first one. So okay. if we end up getting to talk about that one at some point, we'll get more into that. Continuing on, Brody. Uh, yeah, so basically the movie uh, was passed around from cinema to cinema as an R-rated film in America, but having most of the gore scenes cut from his original cut, that displayed a comedic element. It was rece- it received negative reviews as the film was not working until it reached Joe Bob Briggs. Uh, basically, yeah, he agreed to do a Dallas Drive-In premiere of the film, but only in one condition, and that was to show the director's cut, which he had seen at Cannes Film Festival. But, um, yeah, and then once they showed it, in no time, basically, it was selling out in Dallas and then the next state, and it took off around the world. Okay. So, yeah. But it, but it was actually banned here in Australia, um, Sweden, and I think even Austria as well. And in, in that Joe Bob's Briggs interview, he actually states that, like, he was receiving letters from other countries, including Australia, and they were just asking questions about this film, like, what is this film? We need to see it. Like, there was just so many questions. Um yeah, just just how controversial the film at the time was. Um, but yeah, the, uh, what else we got here? Um, yeah, like the crew, the crew knew that they were making like an incredibly controversial film at the time. But there's that one scene where Bilal has sex with Carrie. Oh, and tries Lee, to, tries to. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I won't. Yeah, sorry, Carrie Fraser, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> leaves a pool of blood on her lap, to which some of the crew members walked off set. Offended in a very unpleasant manner to where Hen and Lotter states. And my attitude to that was, yeah, walk off and not only walk the fuck off, go fuck yourselves as you walk off <laughs> because I don't need this shit. <laughs> Over here trying to disturb people and your morals are getting in my goddamn way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I pissed myself laughing so hard when I saw that in the interview. That was pretty great. That was this movie's a pretty serious <laughs> horror <laughs> film until like the ending. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's still a little bit of some comedic elements because I think he really did later on uh, try to play that up a bit. Yeah. Because uh, I think it was part of it was as they were kind of getting low on cash towards the end of the production, they just kind of went, all right, well, we'll just we'll go all in. And I think uh, one of the things that he said in the interview um, that I read where he was talking about it is, is we'll just we're going to pump up the amount of blood, hype it all up and make everyone idiots. <laughs> it's exactly what he said was like towards the end of it was his idea was to just mm-hmm get the movie finished because he just wanted to make a movie. It was just a passion project. Uh, like I said, he thought no one was going to see it. He was like, I just want to make a movie. I just want to make a movie that's really bloody, gory, shock everybody. And if you guys aren't going to help me with that, fuck off. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Fucking A. Uh, Hen and Lotta states that he grew up in New York, Long Island, ah. and would skip school to catch the train into Manhattan. He would sit on 42nd Street to see at least three films and be back in time before school finished. With no conscience of being a film director in the future, it was all done for his love of film itself. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, also, in an interview in issue number 16 of Fangoria, Hen and Lotta stated, I hate to admit this, but any time you hear a woman walking around, that was me in high heels. <laughs> the sound effects were all looped later and created mainly by Hen and Lotta and producer Edgar Levins. I like imagining him now doing that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's such a stud these days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rest in peace, ankles. <laughs> Hendon Lauder stated in an interview with Westworld that he actually only finished the movie as he was convinced no one would ever see it, as stated earlier, and he'd be lucky to make his money. Did you say this already? Um, it was I uh, briefly touched on it, but I don't think they talked about they originally had that that two hundred thousand dollars yeah. in mind. Yeah, they just never got to that point. So when he realized okay. that I'm you know I'm stuck with thirty five thousand, 
let's just do what we can with this and let's just get the thing done. It was kind of his uh his idea for it. Uh, Cause yeah, no, originally it was supposed to have that $200,000 budget. Uh, it just never quite got there because they just kept running out of money during production and then having to show new scenes. They would believe they, uh, it was an, I believe it was an interview with Hentenrick um, where he said we would run out of money. Uh, we would have enough film to shoot one, maybe two scenes. Okay. Really rough cuts. Couldn't reshoot anything. So we'd make two scenes, send it off to investors. Some people would like it. Someone would throw in an extra two grand. We'd film a scene with that two months later. And then just that's how it ended up causing, <laughs> you know, taking a year of their time to film. So the, the movie, the entire movie was planned for a $200,000 budget, which forced him to then have to change everything on the fly due to the budget not being anywhere near is what it originally intended. That's just, yeah, that's pressure on pressure. I know, <laughs> <laughs> which man. And, and, you know, sometimes I, I think, um, having higher restrictions like that uh, can actually kind of help with their creative freedom on it. One of the mm -hmm. best kind of um, examples I can think of for that would be uh, the first Silent Hill game uh, back for the PS1, uh, which PlayStation 1 at that time did not have a lot of memory to render 3D graphics or anything in. So part of it was they had to hide in all the rendering behind the fog, mm -hmm. which ended up being most people's my favorite part of it was just the fact that this whole town was just shrouded in fog. You could see maybe 10 feet in front of you. It made it scarier. You didn't know if something was going to pop out right in front of you or not. And people liked it more for that. And it was made with a reject team uh, made up of, you know, producers that had failed at their other projects. Uh, and it just ended up, I don't know, they, they just ran with the You're little giving me bit some serious mahogany right now. I love the <laughs> Silent Hill games. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah. uh yeah, it's just I think that uh, in some cases like that, higher restrictions can kind of help with the creative freedom for it. Have you played Silent Hill 4? Silent Hill 4? The Room? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I love that's, The Room. That's <laughs> trippy, bro. That's so underrated. But if you're into mm -hmm. trippy stuff, that game is fucking solid. Oh, it's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I played that as a kid. That one kept me up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Brody, anything else to talk about, brother? <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, for the dream sequence in which Dwayne runs new through the street. They yeah, we got some serious style. hog meat there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so which he reckons it was cold that night, but I think he's full of shit. Yeah. Uh, I think it was February. It was like the middle of February in New York at night. Yeah, he's a, he's a grower, not a shower. <laughs> <laughs> As they could not shut down a street to film the scene, they filmed it at night and had actor Kevin Van Hettenrich actually stripped down hide <laughs> and then would try to get the shot whenever there was a break in the traffic. <laughs> the only thing they were able to do for him that scene to prepare for it since they couldn't shut it down was just clean the sidewalk so he wasn't stepping on needles because, again, this was Manhattan. In his dream, he does not have scars. <laughs> ah, oh, true. I noticed that. Yep. Huh. Well, yeah. But that's how but, you uh, can explain it because it is a dream sequence. So. No, that is fair. But yeah, no, uh, it's funny to watch uh, Kevin talk about that in the interview uh, when he talked about that scene was, you know, we couldn't get the permit or anything to shut it down. So it was just I had to strip and then go hide in the side, like by an alleyway or something mm. while uh, I think Frank was sitting next to him just waiting for a, a break in the traffic. And as soon as they wouldn't see any cars, he'd go, all right, go run. <laughs> and they would just try to get the shot. And if a car started coming, he had to duck off to the side and they had to reshoot the entire thing. <laughs> That's an angry pickle shot, as director Adam Marcus would call it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the film was shot over the course of a year in chunks as the production would often run out of money, yeah. as we elaborated on that before. I, I, yeah, I love the creative freedom that he had in this. He, he was just, yeah, as, as um, Nick like, said. Like, just, like Nick said, yeah. It's one of those scenarios where the, the the smaller budget forces you to do things to replace what was traditionally done, which, I mean, works. Look at Nightmare on Elm Street. Look at Halloween. Look at Friday the 13th. Look at all these films that change the course of the uh, horror genre. That's, that's a big deal. You the box to get it yep. done in a budget that small. Yep. So it just forces you to have to get creative with it and the lower budget adds to the the feel of dirt in this film like we said with maniac earlier it's it's just a filthy film like the last film we reviewed made you want to shower this one just makes you want the people on screen to shower <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> every 
time the, the hotel manager comes out. <laughs> uh, dude, I love his pants. They're like dress pants that are too small. So he just wears suspenders and they're not buttoned anywhere. No, <laughs> uh, I remember at one part. Yeah, just it, when it actually kind of caught my attention was uh, it had a shot of him from the front. And yeah. then we turned around and I went, do his suspenders not line up from the front to the back? Wait, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, another thing, uh, so this was the, uh, the bit of interesting casting, uh, that I found actually. Uh, so Sean McCabe, um, is the actor that plays the younger Dwayne, uh, when he's a teenager and he still has Belial stuck to his side and like right after they get him taken off. Um, that actor, uh, he didn't really act a whole lot after this. I think he only really did one movie beforehand and then maybe some TV acting, afterwards but what he did go on to do was become an extremely successful stunt man and stunt coordinator wow! um, yeah <laughs> i mean he he went from you know having raw hamburger meat stitched to a side to, we're talking uh, serious a, shit just, yeah yeah, yeah. It, and it it's nuts he he became uh, a stunt actor he was in aliens uh 1986 alien 3 and 19 underrated uh yeah he was in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves in 91. Uh, he was in Braveheart. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> he was in Goldeneye, Titanic, Ooh. Saving Private Ryan, ah. and the biggest cinematic masterpiece of them all, Brendan Fraser's The Mummy from 1999. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, yeah, so I was just looking through some of the uh, the cast, the lower down on the list, just to see if there was anything interesting. And I saw that man's credits just go all the way through. I was like, okay, we have to talk about that. <laughs> I, I hope that we can continue this trend where we take these films and we just talk about some crazy fucking successful person that mm -hmm. worked on them. That's always fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, it's always cool to see people go on to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, another bit. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that Case or uh, Beverly Bonner, uh, who played Casey, really, really enjoyed playing her character. Yeah. I also found out um, that back in 2013, she actually loved playing that character so much. She wrote directed and starred in a stage play called the life of casey 30 years later um which was just casey's life 30 years on and she owns like her <laughs> own bar and stuff now it i i couldn't really find any film um or like recording of the stage play and i think the last time it was actually uh done was in 2014 which is unfortunate because i would really like to see that <laughs> But uh, it's just cool to see like how much fun everyone had on it. And apparently she had so much fun that she went on to make her own stage play based on it with Hannah and Lauder's blessing. Like, I get 30 years. And that's pretty movie. fucking rad. And it's pretty <laughs> sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what else do we got here? Uh, you, so you have it listed here that as part of the subgenre shock horror exploitation. I, I really couldn't find a really specific subgenre name for it. I, I mean, it really is more or less kind of just a a shock film um maybe not as much as say the like, first film you listed there that kind of relative slumber. slumber party massacre mm -hmm. uh that that series is exploitation heaven it is a driller killer written and directed by women yeah it's fucking rad uh we've done really the first two films on Gorenmore. the second film was got lost amongst the boys uh, yeah. i don't think they really kind of got it uh like the whole playful nature, entertaining nature of that movie. Uh, so that kind of went over their heads, but like the exploitation and the social issues that those films touch on are like, Whoa, oh, yeah. this is more than just <laughs> crazy rockabilly dude killing everybody. Like there's some deeper shit. If you can read into like, this is cool stuff. Uh, and then you also have Henry portrait of a serial killer. Brody uh, likes that film, don't you Brody? I do. And I even like number two. Um, I think two is a very good follow up to that film. But yeah, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, it, it feels like a documentary. Um, just feels like you're going on this wild ride. Mm -hmm. um, who, who's the actor that plays him again? He's in all James Gunn's films. Um, Michael Rooker. That's it. It was him. one of Michael Rooker's yeah. first uh, roles. Yeah. That's right. It was too. He's actually very intimidating in that film. Highly recommend if you have not seen it. And then I never watched the last film. Uh, uh, yes. Night of the Demon uh, hmm. from 1980 as a similar one. It's uh, it's about a film crew that goes out looking for Bigfoot and proceeds to get, well, 
slashered by Bigfoot. <laughs> and that oh. one was actually uh, uh, controversial enough. It was labeled as a coveted video nasty in the UK mm. and subsequently banned. <laughs> Good shit right there. <laughs> Fucking Fuck A. It. So let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> to let go over it or something <laughs> yeah, fucking a so favorite performance slick nick uh i would probably have to say um terry as sharon uh mm-hmm. she she's supposed to be one of the most normal from mm-hmm. the entire show or show movie but is just ab- just off just enough in every line every like like every line delivery mm-hmm. uh her going off on Dwayne about him seeing the landmarks in New York just cracks me up and also kind of makes me uncomfortable at the same time. Like, well, what about the Statue of Liberty? Have time for that? I'm like, why are you just grilling this man? He just sat down. <laughs> like, <laughs> but and it's that way, I, I think, kind of with most of the um, the cast. I think the ADR definitely plays into it a lot uh, because it, the line dubbing in this is not the best, but I think it really helps with the overall tone of it. But yeah, no, uh, I would say Sharon. Uh, she's just off kilter enough to just make you uncomfortable, even though she's supposed to be the normal character. Brody. <clears throat> would it be cheating if I said Hen and Lotta's performance is Belial? No. I would say no, because it's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think um, from a director's point of view, to actually direct and play a creature inside a small basket, um, I think, yeah, it's all about the physicality of how you um, act act out but also not only acting directing at the same time so you know you got a lot going on there but yeah no i really i really like the way belial sort of moves even though we just sort of see his hand but there are some other movements where we see him um betray and kill kill all these um doctors and that so yeah i think Um, uh kevin's performance as Dwayne. uh there's a lot of scenes where he's just talking to himself and i think that it, it definitely uh is conveyed and it's believable in certain scenes. And I think that that allows the film to be carried in a more serious tone at times. And yeah, I think that uh, he definitely plays that part well and keeps the story chugging along with his performance. For sure. I actually almost picked uh, Kevin as well uh, for the same reason for the monologue scenes where he's supposed to be talking to Belial. Fucking a favorite set piece, Nick. Hmm. I really liked uh, Dr. Needleman's office. It's the grungiest doctor's office I've just ever seen. Especially <laughs> All when he goes of them to- are, dude. Oh, yeah. No, every, every, every scene in this is just filthy. Here's and dirty. my there gross office that him. looks like a fucking industrial back room. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and we can go to the room next door, and it's the same fucking way, but now it's a hospital room. And it's your doctor's <laughs> yeah. office room, or it's my veterinary room. Yeah. Like, Pop your shirt off and get in there while I shovel this pizza down my throat and look... And where's the veterinary like, office? Oh, <laughs> underneath an apartment building. <laughs> the basement. <laughs> the basement. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that um, either that or their childhood basement where uh, they cut their father in half with a giant rolling saw. <laughs> might, that might more than that. It's actually. more than that. It's it is like. Oh, I don't <laughs> even know. Saw a pitchfork. A oh, few you know what it looks like? Towels and some- uh, it looks like. The probe, not the probe droid, but the uh, from A New Hope, the torture droid that they put in the. Oh. It doesn't it? Look, yes, <laughs> it's got a bunch of shit sticking out of it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, George, can we borrow something? Uh, Try to yeah. make a movie. Fucking <laughs> My favorite set piece uh, would have to be like the apartment building itself. I think the scenes of the hallways are really claustrophobic and gross, and then the fucking steps. I uh. love. The shots of the steps and people Whoa. like fucking running out of the rooms. It's so cool because it oh, just yeah. makes that place so filthy. Yeah. Oh, you could, the cockroaches. And I bet you it smells awful. Oh, I'm sure they I think they actually did film it just in an apartment block in mm-hmm. like lower Manhattan, uh, like just the front. It was like a, just a storefront uh, that little office. 
that the hotel manager is actually in where his desk is and everything. That is a set dressed elevator. It's an elevator. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I found that out too. Oh man, that made me so happy. That little box that he's sitting in, that's just an elevator they just set dressed for. That's it. fucking cool. Oh wow. Yeah, that's fucking rad. Brody, favorite set piece, bro? Uh, I'd have to go with the basement. It just, it was bringing back, like the tone, the shots were, it was like an evil dead vibe. You know, the, the way it was lit um, and that, yeah, I don't know. It just, yeah, very dark, very dark. And it even just felt like a bit of a German expression type. I will have to say, uh, we didn't mention this earlier. Brody and I watched the 720p43 version of this film. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yep. You, you you watched the 4K restored. Mwah, mwah. Beautiful uh, thing. Indeed. On yes. my 1080p monitor. So but I think I that this is one of those films similar to Evil Dead, that it was shot kind of this way and that it's presented this way so it's kind of enjoyed both ways uh i don't know uh i watch a 4k version of evil dead and it's still in 4.3 and i'm like i'll just watch it on a fucking vcr tv combo and enjoy it just as much i mean sleepaway camp's the same way for me i'd rather watch it vhs than blu-ray only because i feel like the blu-ray gives away all the fucking gags and shit so <laughs> Yeah, I think this is one of those films that would just be fucking phenomenal to rewatch on VHS now. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I believe there was only one original uh, VHS release for this one, too. I don't think they did. Yeah, she's probably uh, fucking one. expensive, buddy. Oh, my God. Yeah. It did has you? to be. Oh, speaking of expenses, somebody put, uh, hey, does anybody know where I can get a, uh, what was it? A, uh, a blu-ray copy of hardware from 1988 and i was like good luck buddy <laughs> <laughs> have fun on your journey <laughs> you want to you want to know how to spend 150 bucks like <laughs> there you go fuck it i think it's i would for that movie yeah I did i get the year right brody is it 88 uh i think it was actually uh 90 98 no, no, like 1990. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't remember who made that. What? Who uh, did the release? Oh, yeah. We spoke about this the other day. Um, was it on this show or was it on the uh, the Goran Moore? I think it was on Goran Moore. Ronan Flix has it. That's right. Yep. Yeah. They had it was that. 1990. Actually. Yeah. Oh, yep. 1990. Okay. Fair enough. So, favorite shots slash scene. Yeah. Um, it, well, for me, it'd be anything to do with Belial in the shot when he okay. jumps out of the. Yeah, just the just the uh, shot of him like tearing over the camera and then making that stupid god awful noise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just can't help but piss myself laughing every time I see it. It's, it's, for me, it's, uh, it's the stop motion is fucking rad. Mm -hmm. I well, think it's Henan, so fun. Well, Henan would have fucking hated it. He actually yep. saw footage of his cuts of that and he threw it across the room he's like nope we're not fucking using that and then when it comes come to the crunch he's just like we have to use it yeah so because uh he did it himself that that stop motion for Belial, so he, he did it himself yeah and yeah. uh i saw another later interview and he said i'm the last person that should have done that i have zero fucking patience i can't work in animation <laughs> 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 so yeah i was actually gonna say my favorite scene was probably belial's rampage in the room yeah. just absolutely throwing stuff everywhere just the stop motion of the drawer flying across the room and all that it kind of allows you to be desensitized to belial because you see him so much on screen at that point and then you're just like okay yeah yeah you know what i mean i can suspend my disbelief now yeah i can believe that this <laughs> giant shit blob with a face on it uh could you know force itself i don't think something that we've now. talked about uh <laughs> To this point yet, I just kind of want to touch on real quick is the device of the basket itself and using it as a trigger point almost as a jump scare by just opening it. Yeah. Yeah. It pretty, it's pretty it's nice. so cool. Like you don't even need Belial in it. It's just fucking scary as it himself because you think Belial's in it. Mm. <laughs> Every time. What's in the box? They, uh, <laughs> they play that up in the second one as well. Oh, okay. Uh, they do. Uh, I think they actually have like some fake outs. Yeah, it's uh, been a while since I watched the second one. Multiple baskets and even Dwayne drops the line what's yeah. in the basket yeah <laughs> favorite effect slash death mine shit i it's the uh like the the mauling with the hands it's the uh the first doctor <laughs> i want to say that we see on screen not the like the first one like the one that they visit in new york 
Oh, Needleman? Oh, yeah, Needleman. Yeah, the one that gets cut in half. It, literally, you just see his hand just... Ah! <laughs> like more ready, more red, more cuts. Ah! Yeah. Yeah. I love that about uh, O'Donovan's death as well, yeah. whenever he goes in to seal the money and Belial rides his shoulders into his bedroom and then just <laughs> gives him a face massage and kills him. So cool. <laughs> well, that money he's playing with was actually their budget. That was their profit. That was their money. And he's playing around with it. <laughs> well, I'll get him <laughs> before he gets out of here. We need that to shoot the rest of this thing. <laughs> um, then uh, my favorite death would have to be the the basement where the father gets cut up because that thing looks like a um, absolute death machine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's so fucking dodgy, but yet so effective. <laughs> and I love how they show um, just these legs that fall yeah. to the ground, like showing less is more in a sense, just leaves it up to you. Yeah. Pick it up okay. in your imagination. I love it. Thoughts on story. So, <laughs> you know, you got your classic, a boy in his bo- blob, a boy in his blob. <laughs> um, <laughs> his actually, Siamese, not Oriental twin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually really like it. Um, Cause I do think that it kind of, um, it just kind of shows like each of their own struggles a little bit that Dwayne wants to have a normal life while still trying to help take care of his brother. Cause he's the only one left to do it now, considering their family, you know, absolutely hated him. Yeah. So he's the only one who's, you know, trying to take care of him and everything, but it's kind of overshadowing his own life feels like he doesn't really have one. So, you know, there's that whole dynamic where he's fighting with Belial cause he wants to go see Sharon just for like an afternoon. And, Belial Sean! <laughs> <laughs> and then, you got Belial, who's just absolutely pissed off that he can't do anything Dwayne does, like walk or, you know, go out with Sharon or like any of that. <laughs> and so <laughs> their whole like dynamic and everything. I, I like it. I like the story for this. I really like where Hel- uh, Hen and Lauder took it. Yeah. Like you said, I love the fucking struggle and the way that it's shown. I love his multiple attempts of living a life outside of his brother. And then it's just like constantly going wrong and it finally breaks him. And then whenever the, He's like trying to like get his fuck on, and then he can't get his fuck on. <laughs> his brother yeah. pops up, and he's like, "No!" Nah! <laughs> <laughs> <Fuck, fuck. laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't, any man, man. The, my favorite part of that scene is f- just the fact that for some reason he just wraps her up in that blanket before he pushes her out. That's <laughs> 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 just why. Fuck it, <laughs> just no reason, out. no reason. No. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> so we're yeah, gonna play blanket monster. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I gotta talk to my brother real quick. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I, I definitely uh, really like the film, especially when um, he really didn't have a story behind the title. He just really liked the title Basket Case, and I think it was originally meant to be like a commercial that he said, as oh, as Nick said, was like it was never going to get seen. So he didn't really care about the way it was um, or what it was, but he's like basically had to conjure this story up. And I think it's a really well-fitting um, story for the title. And overall, it's executed fucking superbly, uh, especially for the budget that they had. But, yeah, I, I really enjoy this film. I think it's great. Fucking A, yeah, it's my dude. One. Oh, yeah, I didn't say my favorite death. I forgot. Oh. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. but, yeah, mine was definitely going to be Dr. Cutter. That, oh, okay. that really long death scream that lasts all the way to the fade out into the yes. hallway and everything of just her with all the scalpels and everything coming out of her face. It was, it was that that's a cool visual. Yeah. Yes. It was hard to pick between that and uh needleman getting cut in half near the mm-hmm. start. Uh, just because, yeah. you know, the, I, I like the shot of, you know, it just showing him leaned against the wall and then panning around to show his legs to show that he'd been cut in half. That was a good one too. But I think I ended up, Sticking with Cutter for that one. I just love the death scream. Cutter. Okay. Impact and takeaways. Brody Kane. Well, I well, I personally see the film of a representation of what we all have hidden, like a dark side that we all carry around. So, you know, just like Dwayne and how he has his he hidden brother in a basket, you know. How do you actually like balance that in certain aspects? The so, same can be said about uh, Hendon Lauder's other film. Yeah, uh, which one is brain that? Brain damage. Uh, brain damage. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, no, I like the way that he plays with that. Um, I don't know whether he intended to go with that theory or whatever it was, but I I believe that's that's what he was going for, and that's what I take away with the film anyway. So. 
in the feels like I, I think I kind of explained mine a little bit as well when I was going over the story, just about the uh, the dynamic between the two of them trying to live their own lives and just kind of being envious of each other in their own ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, just in that, you know, Dwayne has to take care of him all the time while everyone he's, and he's you know trying to shelter him and keep him away from everything because everyone else hates him and is disgusted by him and everything, which is I think something um, that they kind of covered in Freaks as well. So it makes sense that in the special features, that double feature um, would talk about the the similarities between this and freaks. Yeah. So uh, we kind of touched on earlier, the similarities between this evil dead and some other films with the low budget. I think that this film came around at a time early enough in the eighties that it kind of influenced the direct to video uh, would help influence the direct to video. Type it definitely thing going influenced on. the prices. Yeah, for sure. Um, yep. Cause I saw that Hen and Lauder was talking about when it originally came out, it was a $60 fucking movie. Uh, mm-hmm. or like 50 bucks or something like that. And he was like, no, the people who are going to see this are like teenagers who read Fangoria. Like they, yeah. they don't have 60 bucks to drop on a movie. And so he ended up pressuring the the company. Uh, I think it was a media home release. I think it was the name of the company or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, but he ended up pressuring the company, hey, drop it to 20 bucks. And they didn't believe that it was going to work or anything. And he said that they mm-hmm. dropped it to 20 bucks and it sold out immediately. And so they just had to keep making, you know, more more and more copies of it. and i think that this kind of shown the uh young filmmakers up and coming filmmakers that you can make a film it can be distributed on this new medium and that you don't have to spend an arm and a leg to do so uh i think this like like i said and all the other films aided to that type of thing so uh yeah it will impact there absolutely sure. fucking a so let's rate this bad boy uh Five bloody baskets is the rating system this week. I'm going to give it four bloody baskets out of five. Slick Nick? Um, yeah, you know, I'm going to go with four as well. It's it's definitely not completely perfect, but it just astounds me that they were able to do this with that little amount of cash. Okay. And that it was just that much of a passion project for them, and it turned out the way it was. DKB? Uh, well, for an exploitation film, I'm going to give this four out of five bloody baskets. I think it just fits that genre, uh, subgenre very well. Um, yeah, it definitely explores in that category that we that we love so much. Just yeah, it's great. It's bloody. It's a bloody beautiful piece. Four bloody baskets out of five. And what's inside? <laughs> oh, before we wrap up. Uh, yes. That thing I dug out of my closet for this. Um, not sure if it fits entirely, but uh, I have no other reason to dig this thing out every once in a while. Um, okay. So the introduction of Sharon's character when she first meets Dwayne, how she thinks he's a uh, a typewriter mechanic. Yeah. She makes that god awful mouse screeching noise that she says her typewriter is making. And she's got she's got that big electric typewriter behind like, yeah. next to her. I have one of those. Ooh. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Well, he's going to get that. I will say that I ordered some films oh, today. Oh, well, oh, 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 I'll talk about it after he's done. Look at that fucking thing. That's sexy. Look at IBM that. Selectric. Uh, it's from somewhere in between 1961 and 1971. That's what oh, that's fucking rad as hell. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I have no other reason to pull that out, but I wanted to show that off. <laughs> so like I said, I finally pulled the trigger, and today they uh, put the pre-orders up for 1980s Toxic Zombie and Maca- Macal. Yeah, Macal, the night, the Indian Nightmare on Elm Street ripoff. So I pre-ordered those as soon as the fucking links went up, and I'm super <laughs> excited. And tonight at 11.30 Eastern Standard Time, they will be premiering the 4K restoration of Toxic Zombies for free. Uh, I'm super hyped about it. I'll be watching it. And after talking to Brody and Nick, I think Toxic Zombies might be a future episode of this show. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. Speaking of future episodes, let's talk about next week. And that's a me pick. We're going to start off with 1965's The Possessed. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, Bloody oath. I'm super keen to see this, and I ordered it, so hopefully it shows <laughs> up next week. Um, but yeah, no. Nah, from what TJ sent me, it looks fucking epic, so I'm really keen for this. It's definitely a good introduction to Italian cinema, Italian thriller, and it kind of shows you where 
the genre would go, especially into the golden age of the Jelly. So I'm extremely excited to show you guys and share this film. It's going to be different. It's going to touch on some sexploitation stuff and some more perverse type things. Uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be exciting. Be fun. Yeah, for goddamn sure. So I think that's it for this episode. Unless you guys want to add anything. No, I'm pretty. I'm pretty no. good. I believe I'm good. I got to show the typewriter. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> wish it worked. I really wish it turned on, but it doesn't. Yes. Oh, actually, I'll just quickly show you something. There is a basket case over there. So. Oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a friendly reminder, that lights camera exploitation is part of the Project Louder Podcasting Network, home to other great podcasts <laughs> such as. As Big Bad Beetle Bros, which Nick is a host on. <laughs> comics. One. Yes. <laughs> Studley Comics and Kaiju's Ghoulies Unflushed, Gore and More, which Brody and I host on. Jerk the Curtain, Joints and Joysticks, Rabbit Hold, Rants from the Black Wa- Lodge. Oh, almost fucked up. Somewhat Supernatural. The TJ Bowser Power Hour, Two Guys on Friday, Wicked Wednesdays, and Wrestling Ruined. Head on over to projectlouder.net, your source for pop culture, and so much more, and support all the great shows on the Project Louder podcasting network. And of course, all of those are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Audible, and anywhere else you consume audio-only content. Head on over to tpublic.com, search Project Louder and or Beetle Bros to support the network. Uh, Yeah, I don't think that there's anything else we can plug. So that's it for this episode of Lights, Camera, Exploitation. This is your host with the motherfucking most, TJ Bowser, saying see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.